The Mind Tech Podcast, Episode 12, for May 30th, 2013. Lightweight Linux. Tech Podcast, Episode 12, coming at you. I'm Gareth Davis in Los Angeles, California. Once again, I'm joined by Joe Ressington in a rainy London. Is that right, Joe? Yep, it's absolutely pissing down at the moment. The rain and the rain. Yeah, it's the hearing in California. We love the rain. We absolutely love it. I'm being serious. Most people living in Southern California, when it rains, it's like, it's, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's wonderful. Because it rains so infrequently. So when it does rain, it's it's pretty awesome. It, uh, and I, I tell my daughter, because my daughter's always like, oh, I wish it was cloudy. I wish it was overcast. I wish it was raining. It'd be so awesome. She said, oh, I love the rain. I'm like, yeah, but you, you know, if it's raining every fucking day for months on end, that rain shit will get old real quick. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a topsy-turvy crazy land, man, if you lo- like the rain. Oh, love it. Love it. I bet you didn't love it when you lived in Wales. No, I fucking hated it. <laughs> exactly. I bet you thought, oh, yeah, I'll move to California. It'll be hot and sunny every day. Well, this, uh, this, you get sick of the heat, too, you know. Come, come August, when it's like 118 degrees, you know, for mm. days and days and days on end, you will uh, you know, four days into that, you're like, fuck, enough already. You yeah, know, well, when it gets hot that. here, I, I get pissed off with it pretty quickly. Yeah. But I always say, I always think about the snowy and rainy, horrible cold days and think, no, I can't complain about it being too hot. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it'll it'll be over soon, you know, because you know it's it's going to go away and the, the, the cold and the rain and the wet will will come back. Yeah. So what's been happening computer-wise this week? Anything going on your end? Not much, really. Um, wrote quite a long blog post that we'll get into later. Yeah, great one. Um. But no, I, I hear that you've got a new computer, though. So tell me about that. Well, new is relevant. Um, <laughs> it's not new, but it's new to me. Um, I picked up uh, an IBM, well, not, not even an IBM. A Lenovo. A Lenovo. Uh, a ThinkPad. A T61. It's about four years old. Um, but it's in really good condition, like new. Uh, and it runs really well. And the reason I did this, you know, being a hardcore Mac guy, is the reason I did it basically was because yapping to you all these fucking weeks. <laughs> and you're telling me, oh man, open source, Linux, blah, blah, blah. It's the best. It's the greatest. So I thought, well, you know, because I've been running um, virtual machines for uh, forever of Linux. And I've been, you know, I'd fire it up, I'd log in, I'd maybe browse the web, look around, install an app, fuck around with it, but never really use it. And and you mentioned this a couple of times on the show in the past that even though I'm fooling with virtual machines, you know, and you can get like a taste of what Linux is is, is like, but but you you'll only really learn to love it or hate it if you actually use it, you know? If you natively install it and use it for real. Now I kind of did that with my MacBook. But it was dual boot, wasn't it? Sorry. Yeah, so I I I form I I Repartitioned the drive. I installed Linux on a partition, but I still had OS X, which is like my safety blanket, you know. So I I boot into Linux. I would fuck around. I say, oh well, I I now I now I really want to get something done. So <laughs> let me boot back into <laughs> into OS X, so I could you know work on stuff and do things for real instead of you know pl- playing playing around in in, in, uh, in Linux. Um, so I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll snag a, a super cheap. Um, secondhand used ThinkPad, and then the experiment can begin for real. So that's what I did, and uh, I got that on uh, when was it? Saturday, I think. And I've been living in Linux ever since. Uh, in fact, this morning when I got up, I turned on my Mac for the first time in Saturday till now. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, which you you went with Ubuntu, did you? And then Mint, or? Well, so uh, first thing I did was, uh, you know, I, I uh, got it home, fired it up, and it was running Windows 7 Ultimate. What a fucking nightmare that was, dude. <laughs> Tell me about it. How people can live in the Windows world, I, I honestly don't know, dude. 20 minutes into using Windows 7, I, I literally wanted to go and get a hammer from the garage and just smash this computer to pieces. Was it, um, how recently had it been formatted? Did he format it for sale or yeah, did it have all it, this it was, shit on it? No, it was completely formatted, fresh install of... Uh, and it was still terrible. <sighs> dude. So here's the deal. So I thought, oh, he's, he's got... Um, Windows 7 Ultimate. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll copy the serial number and then I'll probably, you know, torrent a, a DVD of, of the, the operating system and install it as a, a virtual machine on my Mac or something. Or, you know, now that I got the serial, I'll keep it for good measure or whatever. So I have it. Hmm. Um, so what I did was I went into the computer. I got the uh, the serial number and I thought, well, I'll just make a text document, paste it into the text document, and then I'll plug in my thumb drive, drag it over to the thumb drive, and there you go. I got the serial. So I'm like, okay, so where's Notepad on this fucking thing? So search, search, there's accessories. No, okay, Notepad, got it. So cut, paste, save to desktop, serial.txt. Boom. I'm like, all right. So I get my thumb drive. I plug it in. Nothing. <laughs> because my thumb drive is formatted for Mac, right? So it's formatted in the Unix file system. There was it, the EXT file system, right? Okay. So I was wondering, is it HFS or e no, it's EXT, a, EXT 3 or 4? EXT, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Journaled Mac OS, EXT, whatever. Yeah. So I plugged that in and nothing. So I'm like, all right. Uh, how the fuck do you format a thumb drive? Because the thumb drive I plugged in, I didn't have anything on it. So it's not like I'm going to format it and lose a bunch of stuff. So I start searching. Clicking here, going into control panel, looking, blah, look, look, look. No idea, dude. The, the, the frustration level builds. It's, it's so frustrating using Windows. Don't you just go to my computer and right-click <sighs> on it? No, because it wasn't even showing up. Oh, what? not even. Oh, okay. Nothing. So it didn't show up. It didn't as, show up. Nothing. Uh, it didn't uh, even no. come up. Because with with a Mac, dude, and I'm sure it's the same with Linux. When you plug in a thumb drive, immediately you get a box that says, "Hey, this, this fucking thumb drive just popped up, and it's a format we don't recognize. You want me to format it for you?" What? Yeah, I don't think that would happen in Linux, uh, it, but it would show up. But then you'd have to kind of go into um, G part it or something to yeah. So you do the mat, you plug it in and it's and it's it's it says yes. You want this formatted? Yes or no? So in one click, it's it's ready to go or not. So I think okay. So I fire up Explorer and I go to, go to Google and I said formatting a thumb drive USB thumb drive in Windows Seven. So I find the first thing I like, and it's like I go to some Windows, windowshelp.com or whatever the fuck. And it starts with, um, click on start. Go to control panel. Click on network, whatever the fuck. And, and I, so I finally get to where it's got to go. And it still doesn't work because it's not recognizing the, 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 the thumb drive. But even to get where you need to go to format the drive is like nine steps. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's nine fucking clicks to format. A th I mean, this is like whoever designed this is like a mental case. You know what I mean? It's like, shouldn't this be like two, two clicks at most? So I ended up just going to gmail.com and emailing the fucking thing to myself. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sign into my Gmail on uh, on a Windows machine. I'd, I'm too paranoid about how shit the security is, especially if I've just bought it off some dude. It could have had. It could be root kitted up to the fucking yeah. bollocks, key loggers and all that. So, so that's what I did. <laughs> so I just emailed it to myself, and that was it. So then, once once I did that, I then grabbed my um, 
you book because I had had two discs already from from the Mac, so I'd had uh, Ubuntu and Mint on on uh, DVD. So I grabbed the disc, I threw that into the uh, the drive, booted into the BIOS, made sure it would boot to the the the, the DVD drive first, and then just uh, let it install. You know, I just wiped the hard drive completely, got all that Windows shit off there, and um, installed uh, Ubuntu thirteen oh four. And installed, no problem. Got it up and running, and uh, it was great. It was big, big plus for me um, because uh, everything worked. There was no driver issues. There wasn't like, oh, the trackpad's not working. Download this driver, or how do you get your Wi-Fi signal working? Download this. No, everything worked automatically off the bat immediately. Which yeah, ThinkPads are very good. They have very good support for Linux. So there was no you know, all the sound work, the graphic, every everything just worked immediately. Um, which was great. Um, so I got that going, and I started customizing a little bit, you know, changing the background, changing the size of the dock, and blah, blah, blah. I installed a few applications, uh, installed Chromium, and uh, I got Thunderbird up and running, got my email going. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool, so I'll start playing around with this. Um, but it was like the more I used it for real... The more I didn't like it, it kind of it wasn't hitting the spot, if you know what I mean. It yeah. did. It was everything worked, and you know it's pretty and everything, but it's kind of clunky. It's terrible. The Unity interface, which I'll get into later briefly, yeah. is it's terrible, man. It might be innovative, but it's still shit. Yeah, it's, it's very clunky, and it just wasn't floating my boat. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, after a while, I thought, you know what, I'll 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 dump this and uh, I'll I, and I remember, oh yeah, I, I loved uh, Crunchbang on uh, in my my virtual machine. So let me download that. So I downloaded um, Crunchbang, burned it to a disk in Ubuntu, and then uh, you know rebooted and installed Crunchbang, and I got that working. And I'm sure that I think that that Crunchbang will probably ultimately be my distro of choice. But it's a lot of work, dude. It's a lot of work to get it the way you want it to work. You really got to get in there and start editing fucking, you know, configuration files and shit. And uh, I was just like, you know, I just want to get shit done. I don't want to be fine. I, you know, I want to drive. I want to drive the car. I don't want to build the fucking thing, at least not now. Maybe later I might, might be into that. But right now I just want to drive it. Yeah. Um, so then I remembered uh, you were you were a big fan of Zubuntu. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, oh, let me give that a shot. So I downloaded that, threw that on there, and that's where I'm at. And uh, it makes sense because when I was running it in a virtual machine, I didn't like it at all, dude. And I remember yeah. I remember running it in, in VM, thinking, how the fuck does Joe like this? This is garbage. <laughs> you know, it's horrible. But when you run it na- natively, it's it's actually pretty good. So have you, have you left it in the default configuration with the dock at the bottom? Well, the dock thing is is a is a pain in the ass for a start. I want that to just go away. I'm sick of the fucking dock at the bottom. I want that gone. Uh, yeah. So I got it to auto hide, so it goes away until I move my mouse down there and it pops up. And yeah. uh, I've I've got a bunch of applications installed. I put Chromium on there. I put Audacity. I got my email working. Uh, and then I thought, um, let's let's see if I can find a good news reader for Linux because I love my news reader. I got a news reader on the Mac called Reader, and it's fucking awesome. It's the greatest app. So I thought, well, I'm I'm probably not going to get anything as good as that, but there's bound to be a bunch of good news reader apps out there for Linux. So I go to Google, type in best news reader app for Linux, and it lists a couple, and I start fooling around. All of them are garbage, dude. Every one I tried was fucking shit. <laughs> Just like absolute crap. So that was not fun. Uh, so then I start, what else I got? Oh, I got a, I got a installed um, Conky. You use Conky at all? I, no, re- what? I really like that. What is it? It's a, a systems. It, it displays your system as far as how much RAM is being used, your processor, your your up and down speed on your internet, your IP address, and it's totally customizable. Okay. Uh, and it, it it runs full time on the desktop. 
and you can change it to like transparent background, different colors. Oh, is that what's in Crunchbang by default? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, right. Yeah, so yeah. I, downloaded I don't really it. like that. I prefer GNOME System Monitor. So you know, I downloaded that and installed it on um, X, uh, um, uh, Zubuntu. And uh, that was fun because yeah, it's not something you can just download, run, and away you go. You got to download it, then uh, create the it, edit the configuration file, then you got to create a startup file and put that in your fucking uh, etc folder in your home directory, and all these steps, which normally I would have been like, "This is a pain in the ass. Why don't this fucking thing just work?" But I was kind of getting into it, you know, the kind of tweaking and fucking around and and changing stuff. And when you yeah. finally get it to work, is a little. You got, I guess you get a little. Uh, little endorphin release in the brain. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, hey, this is pretty cool. I like that. You know, hey, I got it working. I'm not just a big dope. I got this shit working. You know what I mean? Where you yeah. figure that how, most, most How did people... you install things, by the way? Oh, uh, um, I did a mixture of the, um, the what's it called? The Software the, center. The store thing. Yeah, the, the Ubuntu software yeah, center. Yeah, so I did store. some from that and some from AppGet. Okay. So I did a little bit of both. Like if if I wanted to install an app that I couldn't find in the uh, the software center, I then try the app get. Sometimes I got lucky. Sometimes I didn't. Well, Synaptic is uh, was what used to be in Ubuntu and before the software center, and that's a graphical front end for Apt. And it's, ah. I would recommend that. It's it it doesn't look as shiny and fancy, but it's a lot more functional. Like the uh, the the Conkey, I, I had to. Um, that listed it in the the software center, but it wasn't the full app. It was just like a demo. Oh, right. So I had to go to the Conkey website, and uh, they said you can you can either download the the tar file, um, or you can just do the app get. So I just fired up the terminal, did uh, the sudo app get Conkey blah 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 install whatever, and it just just downloaded everything and got it got it going. Yeah, yeah, got it working. <clears throat> But uh, but yeah, it's 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 good. I mean, my my overall feeling is that I like it, but with a big caveat, is that it is incredibly primitive. <laughs> it re- no, I'm not saying that to be mean. I mean, it it really does seem uh, like a step backwards in many many respects. But even though it is a step backwards, it's kind of a fun step backwards too. Yeah, and it's a step forwards for freedom as well. That, that, <laughs> I know you don't true. give a shit about that, but no, no, I no, not at all. No, I do, I do, I do give a shit about it. And and you're absolutely right as far as it being, you know, freedom and open and all that stuff. I mean, you're 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 a thousand percent correct, right? No arguments whatsoever. Um, but as far as look, feel, functionality, it is a little bit backward. Mm. I mean, if 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 you're living in the Mac world and then you're 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 suddenly using Linux, it's it's very primitive. Um, but uh, the 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 power of customization and freedom is is um, is quite compelling, also. Yeah. Because if if you have the um, uh, the time and the inclination. Uh, you you can pretty much do whatever you want. You know, there's, there's, oh, yeah, there's, there's yeah. no kind of restrictions. You can do, you know, whatever harebrained thought pops into your head. If you've got the time and the inclination, you can make that shit happen. Yeah, exactly. If you want to rewrite any part of it, you know, if you've got the, the technical skills and right. the time and the inclination, you can change any part of it that you want. Yeah. And if Or if you don't have the technical skills but you've got money, you could pay someone to do it. Right. And and that is the freedom to do what you want with it, right. rather than with you, you, to change a, a key part of the system with Windows or OS ten. You just couldn't do that. Yeah, this is not going to. You happen. can install stuff on top of it. Sure, that changes sure. it, but you can't you can't adapt the system yeah. to how you want it. Um, so overall, yeah, overall, I, it was a positive experience. It was it's it's a fun experiment. Um, I, I would like it to become more than an experiment, and, and, and maybe it will. Uh, but right now, it, it's firmly in the experiment because it, it, it's like um, whenever I really want to get something done, I still go to the Mac. 
Yeah. When I want to just play around and, and install stuff and figure, you know, oh, look at this. Let's try and get this working. Then it's Linux. But if you actually want to get some stuff done, like, you know, I want to work on a podcast or edit something or update a website or whatever, I, I got to go to the Mac. Because the tools that are available are a lot more professional, a lot more functional, you know, and it just works. <laughs> Don't start with that shit again. <laughs> well, it does. It's true. I no, mean, no, in, 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 in Linux, it just works, too. After several hours slash days slash months of fucking around with it. Well, in my case, after several years of fucking around with it, I now know how to, then it'll to work. customize it how I want and install the things that I need. Right. And so now, yeah, you're at the point now where it'll just work, right? You know, because yeah. you, you know how it works. You know how to tweak shit and you've got it the way you want it to 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 be at. Uh, but from with a Mac, you're you're at that point the minute you plug it into the wall. Not plug it into the wall and then fast forward three years. Now we're ready to go. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's a good point, I suppose. But uh, but yeah, it's been good. I've I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, the the ThinkPad itself, um, the build quality on these things is very impressive. Even though it is just all plastic, and it does have a very plasticky feel, um, it also has a very solid feel. They feel yeah, they, they are very, it's sort of hard plastic rather than flimsy plastic. Yeah, it's, it's very, very tough and solid, and it, it looks, it, it feels like, I don't know, man, like a block of wood or something. It feels very, very tough. And, uh, and the keyboard on it is the fucking bomb. The keyboard is awesome. Love the keyboard on it. And it's got the nipple mouse as well, isn't it? Yeah, but I mean, who, who uses that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That. I quite like them. I've got a really ancient ThinkPad from yeah. the I don't know mid nineties, and uh, I used to like using the nipple mouse. Yeah, it's got the little red thing on it. But um, you've not used that at all. Then. Well, I, I, I oh look, the mouse moves, <laughs> and then that's it. <laughs> but the, the the track part, the trackpad on it is really small too, compared okay. to you know now trackpads are pretty big. But uh, this is like four years old or whatever. So it's kind of it makes sense. Back then, they weren't that big as they were now. Yeah. Um, but the build quality is really, really nice. Very impressive. Mm. Well, yeah, you have to keep us posted then on how you get on with it. Well, we, we shall see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I don't know whether I'm going to stay with Zubuntu, but so far I'm liking it. Uh, I'll convert you, yes. But, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. Well, we shall see. Yeah. See what happens. Um, and I, I really because I've been, I've been getting a little paranoid recently, and uh, using Linux just makes me feel a little safer. Yeah, you know. But uh, we'll see. That's just my tinfoil hat mania. <laughs> it, ki- it kicks in every once in a while, you know. It comes and goes. Yeah. Um, I think I said, I said said it to you earlier. Sometimes I become very, very paranoid, and then you know, two weeks later, I I don't give a shit. I'm like, whatever, fuck that. I don't give a rat's ass. But it, it comes in waves. <laughs> yeah, it's weird how you. I see on Twitter. Um, I I signed in at. Uh, or I checked in at Starbucks, or I was here, yeah, just yeah. To, to yeah. announcing to the world exactly what you're doing. Yeah, but, that's, but that's in, not my style. In my defense, though, usually when I'm doing that, I'm in the car driving away. Ooh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, but it's still, um, you, your movements are tracked and well, like on the internet. Well, well, let me put it this way: whether or not I track in. At whether or not I check in at Starbucks, if I got my phone in my pocket, they know where I am. Yeah, I suppose. Whether or not I'm saying, hey, I'm at Starbucks. If they want to know where I'm at, if I got the phone in my pocket and they want to know where I'm at, it's child's play. Yeah, if they wanted to know in real time. Um, but I don't think the, 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 the position of everyone's phone at, at all times could possibly be logged. We were talking about how much data and huge data centers would be required to log emails and phone calls and shit. But to log the position of everyone's phone at every second of every day, I don't think there are enough hard drives in the world to log that that data. So I'm, I'm talking more of a long-term thing. They could look mm. back. And obviously, once it's on the internet, then it's archived and it's never going away. 
and so it's the ah well he was at this Starbucks at this time on this date and then and you know you you leave in a trail aren't you yeah I I hear what you're saying but I I don't know um I mean I I, I have no inside information one way or the other um but I I lean towards the side of yeah they do keep all that but I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe we'll find out one day. Yeah, I think um, um, I, I think they do. I mean, no, nobody's sitting behind a monitor watching like, oh, look, look at Joe. He's just walking down the street. And no, 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 nobody's doing that. But uh, everything is kind of archived, I think. Mm. It's, it's, it's after the fact. Can they put it all together? Um, they only do real time if, you, if you're on, the, on their radar. If, if, if you do something that kind of makes them look at you, then everything you do is, is, is uh, documented in real time. Um, if not, if you're just, you know, Joe Blow out and about doing whatever, then everything is still documented, but uh, nobody's looking at it. It's just archived. Yeah. For yeah, I suppose. a later date. But, I mean, I, I don't know. Everything I just said could be complete nonsense. I, I don't know, but I have a strong suspicion that it's not. Yeah, same. Um, you can never be too sure, but from from what you hear and news stories that come out, it seems pretty clear that they are logging everything. So yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, should we do some news? Yeah, go on. Then. All right, here we go. Mind Tech Podcast. Here is the news. First up, we got police tap social media in wake of London attack. A dedicated team of British police are monitoring social media around the clock in the wake of last night's, that's last week's, fatal attack on a soldier in southeast London in order to gauge the sentiment and be ready to respond. Umut Ertigal, who runs the open source intelligence unit for London's Metropolitan Police Service, today told OSCERT Information Security Conference uh, a team of 17 staff were working seven days a week to track social media feedback and to monitor community tensions. There's a lot of work we're doing to analyze the language and how people are talking on Twitter. So this this kind of ties in what we were just talking about before the break, I guess. The uh, the uh, this, but this is actually you know they have seventeen people actively staring at screens, going through data, as opposed to just archiving it and sorting it out later. And it it always blows my mind. Well, not blows my mind, but it, it piques my interest when when something does happen like this, and almost immediately they have the guys they have full access to the guy's Facebook account, his Twitter account his email, and, and everything. And, and they do it on the news, you know. And, you know, the, the suspect last week on Twitter posted this. You know? Mm. What, what jumped out at me from this article is that they are saying in it that automated um, data mining do, does not compare to actual human eyeballs looking at it. Um, and I don't know if it's them just trying to justify money saying that, you know, money going to these 17 people. But he was saying that because of people use slang and don't spell things right and right. whatever, that no computer is as good as a human. Right. And, and looking at who's friends with who on Facebook. Sure. Um, I would agree with that to a point, um, which is why, you know, when they do go back and pull that data um, you know, there's a human that's going to sit there and go through the data and, and data mine it for relative information. Um, it's not going to be all uh, automated and have some machine pull stuff out of it, which I should add is is coming. <laughs> you know, it, it, that, that, yeah. that will happen uh, if, if it's not already happening. It absolutely will. But... Um, this 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 article is right in that respect, you know, that that uh, to to have that information pulled up in front of a person where they can look at it and, and gain context that the machine might not might might miss. You know? Yeah. Another interesting thing was um that it says in this article that 
during the Olympics opening ceremony, there were 10,300 tweets being posted every second. Wow. That's it shows you the, the amount of data that they're having to deal with. That is it's pretty crazy. And that they have an, such an exact number like that. Yeah, that's true, actually. It's not around 10,000, 10,300. Yeah, it's not like, oh, yeah, we estimate around 10,000 tweets were made during the operating, op- opening ceremony. Even if they said that, you'd be like, oh, wow, that's a lot. But to actually say, you know, 10,300, mm. not 10,299 or 10,301. Yeah. <laughs> it's what, a very, very exact number. And what's the numerology of 10,300? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for 33 in there, but there isn't one. Well, yeah. it, th- it does say 32 million social media articles uh, through, were monitored through during the Olympics. Olympics. Yeah. So that's nearly 30. If they put 33, then I would have been definitely going crazy. So the, the, and the, this really does, it, it, it paints the picture that uh, social media is, is a wonderful tool for intelligence uh, uh, operations because we're doing their job for them. We're making things so much easier for them. Well, it's like, yeah, you checked in at, at Starbucks. Starbucks and- right, yeah. You, and, you are doing their job for them. They don't need to to tail you, and they you're doing it for yourself. Right. In your case, obviously, you are just an, an innocent family man, whatever, just doing your daily boring shit. But <laughs> I don't know, like, are terrorist types, or if if such a thing really exists, are they um, there going? Oh, I checked in at uh, Morrison's buying fifty bottles of bleach to make my bomb. You know. No, I mean the. the I mean, all you need to do to kind of subvert this is just leave your phone at home. Yeah, leave or, your phone or, at home. Don't or, go on. Don't have a Facebook account. Or give don't. it to somebody else, you know. I mean, like, uh, if if you're going to be up to some crazy bullshit, you give your phone to your buddy and say, hey, here, take this phone. Here's 50 bucks. Hop on a train someplace. I'll be back at 6. Later. Mm. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And then you go meet whoever you're going to meet in a public place while your phone is on a train headed to who knows wherever the fuck, you know? Mm. So there's lots of I don't of see, I don't see how infiltrating social networks is really going to do anything other than just spy on people. It's not going to catch anyone who's up to anything that's dubious or, you know, terrorists or anything like that, because anyone with any brains is not going to be on if you're if you're a terrorist planning some shit, you're not going to be on the internet publicly, are you? And ha- have right. friends on Facebook and all all that shit. Or if you are, you're going to be deliberately trying to subvert them by acting really normally and having no other mental case friends. Well, what what it's doing is is that it's pro- it's providing them with a gauge for who you are and who your friends are, who you hang, who you hang out with. It, it, it'll it'll paint a picture as to whether or not you're potentially going to be a pain in the ass or if you're completely harmless or maybe you're an undesirable maybe you know you're not going to do anything crazy like blow something up or act like a maniac but your belief systems are going to be so at odds with the ruling power that you're going to be placed in a little uh on a file for people or whatever that uh, that are not in line with the way you think things should be, and I think that's more more likely what what's going to be going on here, right? Because all this terrorism stuff, if it even exists, let's be honest, if if it really is for real, it's still a tiny, 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 tiny minority of people. Yeah, but of yet, course, man. but yet they're surveilling everyone. Mm. It's like when they bring in laws to to protect everyone. A, a few bad people make uh, you know a, a tiny, tiny minority of people fuck it up for everyone else. Because you're you're you're, you're I mean, everyone is being surveilled, right? Whether they know it or not, every single person is being electronically surveilled. Well, yeah. All right. What's next? Right. Next up. Um, is WikiLeaks tears apart We Steal Secrets documentary in full annotated transcript. 
On the eve of the international release of Alex Gibney's WikiLeaks documentary, We Steal Secrets, the organisation is blasting the film, leaking a complete annotated transcript, reporting dozens of factual errors and instances of sleight of hand from the Oscar-winning director. In the transcript, WikiLeaks points to, amongst other things, the use of a crude gay caricature to paint Bradley Manning's decision to leak (laughs) US military and diplomatic documents as a failure of character rather than a triumph of conscience mm. um, etc etc it's uh yeah looking like this is a bit of a uh a hit piece on WikiLeaks. surprise surprise it it does seem like that i saw the trailer to this movie a, a while ago and i and when i first, when the trailer first started i was like oh wow i really want to see this but by the time the trailer ended I really got the impression that this is kind of be a total, uh, like you said, hit piece where they're just trying to paint them in a light like these guys are mental, they're full of shit, they're you know these guys are fools. Um, yeah, which I don't believe to be the case at all. No, it's interesting that he um, he tries to make it out that Bradley Manning didn't do it out of because he thought it was the right thing to do. So it, why why would he do it then? Why? Why would he leak all? Well, that exactly. Stuff? It says, uh, well, the, they describe it as the, uh, a failure of character, like he he was weak or something, and and divulged these secrets when he shouldn't. See, have. I, I, the, the, that kind of action does not, to me, does not donate weakness. It, it does, it's the opposite. It's strength. Exactly. Considering he's, he knew that it was going to be fucked for doing it, uh, as he is, he's looking at a long time in prison. Right. And so, yeah, it's obviously the opposite of weakness. Totally. I mean, I, I, something just popped in my head right now, and I used to have conversations like this many, many years ago where, um, you know, if, if, if there was a draft and if you were drafted to go to war and you said no, people would call you a coward, when in reality the exact opposite is true. Mm, I don't know about that, really. I mean, I wouldn't go on principle, but a part of that principle is that I don't, I don't want to die. So well, no, it's like when when you have that much peer pressure, right? Not only is like you know your friends and your family, but society at large, right? If if it's a war that everyone's like, imagine World War Two, right? Imagine World War Two, right? The, uh, the the Nazis are going mental, doing all kinds of crazy bullshit, and uh, there's a mandatory draft. And everyone's going. I mean, the whole culture is behind it. Everyone is like, "Yeah, we gotta fuck these guys," and you're like, "Nah, I'm 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 not going." Yeah, that's balls right there, dude. That's fucking balls. That's far braver than actually going there. I suppose it's a different kind of braveness. To to the it does take uh, balls to to go and face it and face almost certain death especially in world war one well, uh, see a lot of a lot of on. people though they they go they would go to war because it's well you know i don't want to go i, I don't give a fuck about the war but i guess i got to because if i don't man what will everyone think of me yeah yeah that's true yeah, so they just go along and and kind of cross their fingers and hope that <laughs> that they get they get put in the in the kitchen or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, as opposed to uh, you know storming the 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 the, the village or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think of someone like that to come out to do that, that that speaks of strength, not weakness, for sure. Yeah, it says at the end of this article anyway that um, that WikiLeaks suggest two other upcoming films by Ken Loach and Laura Poitras. I've never heard of her before. But, yeah, it seems that there'll be a few films about WikiLeaks. It's obviously a bit of a hot topic, or it yeah. was a while well, ago. Anyway. Isn't there a, a movie coming out with um, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch playing Julian Assange? That might be the Ken Loach one. And it's not it's that's not a documentary. That's like a, a, a dramatization of events. You know, it's like a like a movie movie. It's not Yeah, like not a, a biopic. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, I'm not sure about that. Because, I mean, Assange really is. I think he's a very interesting character. You know, it's it's fascinating the way things have kind of played out. 
There's something very sinister and creepy about him, though. I would, well, I don't know about the sinister, but the creepy thing, for sure, I would agree with you there. It, it, there's definitely a kind of vibe from him that's a little off. It's the same with his buddy um, Applebaum, J- Jacob uh, Applebaum, the, the other guy. Uh, I mean, right. I, I totally respect him. I think the stuff he says is on the money, and, he, and he's very cool, you know, things he has to say about privacy and, and all that stuff. But he does give off a vibe like he's a little off. Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, uh, dare I say it, it comes off a little bit rapey. <laughs> <laughs> like it's very kind of, I don't know, like you can't put your finger on it, but he, he gives off a vibe like I'm a little bit, maybe not mental, that's, that's not the right word, because he doesn't come off like he's he's crazy. Uh, he comes off very, very rational and, and um, you know, uh, uh, down to earth. But there is this, there's something there that's not like um, he doesn't give off the vibe like, hey, it would be great to hang out with him and have a few beers. Yeah. Not, yeah, even, exactly. not even close. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Like if you, if you went out and had a few beers with him, it would be like a massive fucking downer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It would be like doom and gloom. You'd, wanna, you'd walk out of the pub wanting to fucking hang yourself. <laughs> no, um, you never know. You might be a laugh. You might, might be. You never know. But that's not the yeah. vibe he gives off. But hey, you know, vibes can be wrong, right? You know, mm. you're not always yeah. right. It's it's called the Fifth Estate, anyway. Um, the the Benedict Cumberbatch biopic. What's it called? The Fifth What State? Estate. Estate. Okay, the Fifth Estate. Yeah. Any new, when when is that coming out? Do you know? Uh, it looks to be coming out uh, in the UK on the first of January next year. Oh, wow. so we got a while to wait. I thought it'd be out sooner than that. Uh, oh, no, in the US it's coming out um, October, so not that long. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks so interesting. I'll, I'll certainly be checking that out when, it, uh, when it's released. Yeah. And uh, in, in, the, uh, in the spirit of WikiLeaks, I'll torrent it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's get on to our next uh, story here. Let's see. This is a good one. Uh, Confidential Reports lists U.S. weapon system designs compromised by Chinese cyber spies. Cyber spies. Designs for many of the nation's most sensitive advanced weapon systems have been compromised by Chinese hackers, according to a report prepared for the Pentagon and to officials from the government and the defense industry. Among more than two dozen major weapon systems whose designs were breached were programs critical to the U.S. missile defense and combat aircrafts and ships, according to a previously undisclosed section of the confidential report prepared for Pentagon leaders and the Defense Science Board. Experts warn that electronic intrusions gave China access to advanced technology that could accelerate development of its weapon systems and weaken the U.S. military advantage in a future conflict. That's kind of interesting right there. That, that was what jumped out at me in a future conflict, yeah. as if it's definitely going to happen. Yeah, well, it is. I'm sorry. It's... It is. I mean, I've, I've been saying this for forever. It's going to happen. You know that sooner or later, we're going to have to fight these guys. Well, my dad's been saying it to me since I was a little kid, man. 20-odd years he's been saying it to yeah, me. So. It, it's coming. Uh, it, it's going to happen. Um, that's just the way the, the plan is laid out. That's going to be the big, the big deal that'll usher in the new world order. <laughs> um, you know, um, when, I, when it'll happen, I, I don't know, but I, I definitely think it's a when and not a if. Uh, hopefully, it'll happen. You know, a hundred years from now, <laughs> but but who knows? Might happen next week. I don't know. Um, but we're getting a lot of stories like this. Um, which are painting uh, pictures that the Chinese are hacking into every fucking thing you can imagine, right? You're sort of seeing this constantly. Chinese hack this, Chinese hack that, Chinese get access to blah, 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 you know, constantly. What this is doing, I think, um, short term at least, is it's it's giving the, um, the military-industrial complex uh, a new bad guy. Um, because even though the, the whole terrorism thing is is still around allegedly, um, it is kind of winding down. So they kind of do need a new bad guy. Because hey, without bad guys, what the fuck do we need them for? You know, we got to have a bad guy, 
right? Mm. Or are we spending billions on fucking bombs and shit if, if, if we don't have anyone to fight? Yeah. Well, speaking of which, in this article, now I, I just cannot believe that this is true. It says also on the list, uh, so this is a list of um, blueprints or whatever that they, the Chinese stole, um, uh, is the most expensive weapon system ever, ever built, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter which is on track to cost about $1.4 trillion. Oh, Jesus. That can't be for one plane, surely. Oh, that must be. I, I don't know, dude. But, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it blows my mind when you think about that. Okay, let's just say, I mean, I, whether, it's, whether this is for 50 planes or just one, I have no idea. But oh, no, they, they're between 150 and 200 million each. I've just looked it up. Okay. So let's let's just say you know it's like half a dozen planes comes to one point four trillion dollars, and that's spent on war, on death. Do you know if you yeah. took if you took like you know a quarter of that amount of money, you could like end hunger on planet Earth. Well, yeah, but the the point is that if you, I've spoken to someone very old and wise about this this thing before about the if you stopped spending the money on the um the military and and spent it um feeding people instead and he pointed out to me that if you don't spend that money on the military then the the whole system just collapses basically right because that the money is only worth uh worth its value if it's being spent and um it's quite a hard thing to, to explain. It's quite a hard thing to understand, even, and I don't well, no, fully he, understand. He's he's absolutely correct, but but that 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 uh, that thinking only came into being after World War Two, right? Because so much money was because the the economy after World War Two was in, in the United States was booming. Yeah, right? booming. You know that's why the '50s were such a, a an affluent decade in in in, uh, in the U.S. And, you know that's why they call it you know, the baby boom. You know the people had tons of money, they had a nice house, they had the two cars. You know they were banging like crazy, having kids. You know the baby boom. It was, it was a great time, right? Because of this yeah. affluence, because we discovered that when you have all of the nation focused on war. The economy explodes. So at the end of World War II, you know, we beat the Nazis, and they're like, "All right, now what? Well, we got to have a bad guy to keep this shit going. We got to keep these wheels turning. We got to keep the economy going. So let's have a Cold War with Russia. You know, we'll never actually fight, so there won't be any real death. But we can have a Cold War. Where we'll keep escalating the arms, and, and the economy will just keep going and going." And because that was so successful, we've had to keep that up. And we continue to keep that up. Yeah. You know, fighting him. So that's why we always need bad guys. So even, yeah, if, even, if, there, even if there isn't a bad guy, well, we'll just fucking make one. We'll just manufacture one. Because we got to have a bad guy. We got to have a threat to our way of life. There must be a threat to our way of life. In other words, we have to have a threat to justify all this fucking money we're spending on this shit, which apparently we'll never have to use. But I've just looked up this F-35 joint strike fighter to yeah. see what's how it, much they cost, right? What's it look like? And, um, Are they on uh, sale this week? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> after a new fighter. <laughs> well, I just looked on Wikipedia, right? Now, this article that we're talking about here, or we're supposed to be talking about, um, <laughs> <laughs> is, um, is saying that the Chinese hacked in to... Uh, you know, government servers, whatever, and stole these designs. Now, I'm not being funny, but have a look at Wikipedia. It fucking details all of the details of the... Yeah, I could build one of them <laughs> if I had enough money just by looking at Wikipedia. It says all the measurements and everything. So I don't know what they're talking about, but I just, I just think it's bullshit. As you say, it is, it's all laying the groundwork for a coming, hopefully, Cold War. Well, I suppose we're in a cold war with China, a, a cold cyber war at the moment. Yeah. Um, so th this this is going to work twofold for, for, for us, this whole Chinese hacking thing. Whether or not they did it is kind of irrelevant. 
uh, it's going to work in, uh, well, you know, this is an up-and-coming bad guy, right? Uh, you know, well, Mr. President, we hope that it'll never come to war. But if it does, we have to be prepared. All right, so let's spend more money on bombs and shit just in case. But because it's cyber attack, well, you know, we got to beef up our fucking uh, security systems here. We got to have, you know, cutting edge fucking security bullshit so that, that these fools can't hack into it anymore. So we need more money there, too. Right. So why don't you give us a shitload of money that we can spend on cyber security? And while we're at it, this Internet is way too fucking free. There's all these people reading all kinds of bullshit and up to all, up to all kinds of shenanigans on the Internet. We need to lock that shit down. Plus, if we lock it down, we can make some cash in the process. Oh, yeah, let's do that, too. Boom. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right there. So that's so. This is uh, you know the fact that we're seeing these these news reports is just is just adding fuel to their fire. I mean. Could the Chinese be hacking into the shit? Of course, it could be legit. Or, or maybe the Chinese, like, we hacked into what? What the fuck are these guys talking about? We didn't hack into shit. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter. Mm. Just means they get more funding to do the bullshit that they need to do. We got to have a bad guy. Got to. If we don't have a bad guy, we don't need a military. We don't need a military. The economy's fucked. So. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's do. Uh, let's see. Let's do one more story, and then we'll, we'll we'll move on. We got one here, which is uh, a little disturbing on many levels, but we're going to go there. This is uh, from uh, Milwaukee Associated Press. Uh, a federal magistrate in Milwaukee has ordered uh, a West Alice man to provide readable versions of encrypted hard drives seized from his home as part of a child pornography investigation. The order, the order by U.S. Magistrate Judge William Callahan Jr. marks a reversal from his earlier decision that the Fifth Amendment in- insulated the suspect from such a mandate, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported. Callahan said the difference is the FBI has since decrypted part of the system seized from Jeremy Fieldman's apartment. Among the roughly 700,000 files were mainly that clearly constituted child porn. The agents also found files containing detailed personal financial records relating to Fieldman and dozens of personal photographs of Fieldman. That, along with the FBI's claim that the unencrypted computer also seized from Fieldman's apartment, had the file names suggesting child pornography was enough for Callahan to conclude it was a foregone conclusion that Fieldman had access and control and seized his hard drives. This is a scary case. Now, admittedly, we don't know the full story here as to how this guy got up on their radar, whether it was a sting operation or whether they just randomly found some shit that that he was up to. I I really don't know. But um, the fact that they seized his computer and it says that the FBI had decrypted part of the system but couldn't decrypt another part. Therefore, they, they need this guy to hand over his password to decrypt the files. And if he were to do that, he would essentially incriminate himself. You know? So it's the Fifth Amendment, yeah. isn't it? That you're, you're right that we don't have in this country, but you have, that you, you can stay silent right. uh, because, if it's because if he, to if, not incriminate yourself. Yeah. Because he's, he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? Because it's like if, uh, <clears throat> if, he, gives, if he cooperates and gives over the password... And he does have some shady bullshit on his computer. That's just going to make his case a million times worse. Mm. But if he doesn't and he, he keeps his mouth shut, then he's still fucked. Well, he's going to be in contempt of court. Now, I don't know how long you can get. Uh, can, can you be put in prison for a long time for contempt of court? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. But if he's got child porn on there, then surely... It's better to, I would have just said, if I was in his position, I don't know, I forgot the password. Sorry, God. <laughs> I mean, I've got passwords to sites that I've forgotten, and I uh, oh, yeah. have to do the um, the email thing, you know, the reset your password. Right. So you could say it was a really long 
complicated password. I well, don't, that, don't know what it is. Sorry. That's the thing with encryption, though. I mean, if uh, if you do forget what password you use for an encrypted file, then you're fucked. You're done. Well, you can you can brute force it, but uh, and that's obviously what they did with one of his drives or yeah. partitions or whatever. But they they couldn't brute force the other ones. So. Well, it depends on you know how 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 uh, powerful the encryption algorithms you're using. Um, some of them are so powerful that it's uh, it's unlikely that you could brute force it, you know, with, unless you had you know a supercomputer, and that would take years to to crank it. Yeah, I've heard that some of them are as yet almost uh, uncrackable, at least in practical terms. Yeah. So it would take, you know, maybe if you had a supercomputer, it would take 100 years or longer to crack it, you know, for for something as as dopey as this. I mean, no one's going to invest that amount of time and or money in cracking his, his nonsense. Plus, he'd be dead by the time it, it's done. Yeah. So their only op- option is for him to, uh, to to hand over the password so they can uh, take a look. Now, I was wondering, though, what if, if they were, if he were to give the password and they were to decrypt it and there was like just, you know, pictures of his cat or some shit. And how, how would that affect his case? Mm. Well, surely if there was, well, this is, sounds a bit Daily Mail, but there's no smoke without fire. Why? Why is he bothering to make this big stink if there's no, you know, child porn on there? If if it was me and they wanted me to, you know, uh, give him a password, I'd be like, yeah, well, there's just a a lot of. Um, Pro Tools files and, uh, you know, music that I've made. Yeah. So no problem. But if he's genuinely got shady bullshit on there, then, hmm, that's obviously why he's doing it. Unless he's just trying to, to make a stand for freedom and well, fuck yeah, yeah Fifth that, Amendment. That's what I was going to say is that, you know, if, if if everyone went down this path, then it would make a lot, you know, whether whether it doesn't really matter whether you have any shady stuff on your computer or not. But if everyone did routinely encrypt stuff, um, it, it would make things a lot uh, fairer, freer, and better for everyone. Uh, but because so few many, so few people do this, it it's kind of looked at like, oh, what's what's uh, what's he trying to hide? You know, what's this guy up to? Um, you know, a few weeks ago when we were talking about the Tor network, and uh, I said, yeah, I've, I've used Tor, I have it installed. You know, it gives an anonymous uh, browsing on the internet, and someone posted. Only pedophiles use Tor. Well, no, it's I. Um, I brought up the that my impression of it is that it's a pedophile network. See, I, I, I honestly that that thought had never popped into my head until you guys brought it to my attention. Mm. You know what I mean? In my mind, it was like, well, Tor, Tor is something that's awesome because it gives it gives you a level of anonymity online, so that uh, you know marketers and corporations and governments can't see where you're going and what you're doing. And then, yeah. but then when you said that, I was like, oh, fuck, ruined it. <laughs> well, that and also stuff like the Silk Road, which you're not supposed to talk about. What is that? that I'm, I'm completely unfamiliar with that. Also, what what is well, this? I've never hooked it up and seen it, but what, what Silk is it? Road is uh, a deep web off radar thing. You need to use Tor to to get there. It's not just the Silk Road dot com or whatever, <laughs> and um, it's pretty much uh, well. I, I've never seen it, so I don't know. But my understanding is that it's, uh, I suppose, the black market eBay, uh, and you can buy drugs and weapons and whatever you want there's some legitimate stuff on there um and there's a um uh, like a, a rating system you know a reputation system and stuff yeah and um the the only currency used there guess what it is bitcoin ah right so it's it, the the bit, bitcoin advocates that are trying to make it go more mainstream don't like to talk about silk road because Without Silk Road, Bitcoin would not be as valuable as it is because most of the transactions that go on are Silk Road transactions. Yeah. So, yeah, as I say, I've never been there. I don't know much about it. And it's supposed to be like a bit of a fight club thing. You're not supposed to talk about it. So, 
Interesting. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's fascinating, and it, it really does kind of. Uh, I mean, when when you get uh, governments and corporations deeply involved in the internet, when they do try to regulate it and pass laws and tell you what you can and cannot do, it's only natural that these different levels of access will 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 evolve, will will form. You know, where there there'll be uh, uh, different tiers to the level. Yeah, exactly. of, of just what I was going to say, the multi-tier. Yeah, I mean, it's that's, people who are just on Facebook, right? And then you've got people who are a little bit more tech savvy, right? And and then you've got the people who are really into it, who are using Tor, and then there's probably other things that we haven't even sure. heard of. Yeah, there's there's more, even more uh, levels to it, um, and. You know the 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 more shady people in society, as far as you know, if you're up to no good, you're going to be kind of attracted to that level to kind of keep everything on the down low, right? Because you're you're up to no good, so you're going to mm. be focused on that. Um, unfortunately, uh, and that's that's that I think that's the way things are going to go. You know, there's going to be like uh, you know, like in any kind of repressive society, there's always a black market, right? You know, look at Soviet Russia, right? You know, where, you know, the, the, everyone's supposed to be the same. There's no rich people. There's no poor people. Everyone's the same. But, you know, if you go to a politician's house in, like, 1974, they're going to have some nice shit. Yeah. You know, whereas you go to the apartment for some fucking steel worker in Soviet Russia, and he's he's living in fucking bare minimum. What's up with that? You know? Aren't we all supposed to be the same? What's going on here? Um, so it, it's it's kind of like that, that kind of, uh, uh, you know... That kind of black market deal, you know, there's always stuff available, you know, no matter what you want, if you want it bad enough, you're going to be able to get it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's never going to go away. Uh, it's, you know, regardless of what laws are passed, that shit is it's just going to be get darker and darker. Um, I think I mentioned on last week's show, you know, that the, the, we're, we're either at the beginnings of or, or in the middle of because I, I really can't judge where but i know that it's either happening or going to happen there's going to be like a kind of cold war between uh citizens and and the government as far as the internet because the the government wants to control the internet and the people don't want them to yeah so there's going to be very much a kind of tit for tat kind of uh, uh exercise going to go on or we're going to pass laws to do this. Oh, you're going to do that? Okay, well, guess what? We're going to do this. I think it's going to be a minority of people, though, who uh, w will do things like the deep web. Uh, I, I don't think that the tiers are going to be equal in terms of numbers right. by any stretch of the imagination. You're going to have See, the a, a small handful of people. The thing that gets me every time, though, is you know, like, uh, Google and Facebook and all this nonsense. Uh, they're harvesting all our data, data mining everything, and then they're selling it to advertisers to market stuff to us. Now, as long as that data is, like, anonymized before it's sold to advertisers, I, I really don't have a problem with it. You know, if I get targeted ads to me, you know, on my, my web searches, I'm I'm okay with that. You know, Facebook makes a bunch of money with that. Google makes a bunch of money targeting ads at me because of my data. It's all anonymized, but I'm still, you know, then I'm, I'm fine with that. The issue that I have is that governments and or organizations also have access to that data. And when they have access to that data... It's never good. You know? Yeah. It's it's never going to be like uh, Joe Blow from the government knocking on your door saying, oh, Mr. Ressington, we've just analyzed, you know, the last 10 years of your internet usage. And uh, we, we've discovered that you need a, a, an income tax break and we're going to write you a check right now for, for several hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> you know, it's it's never positive. Yeah. It's, it's whenever... They contact. It's, it's always going to be negative. Always. You know. Yeah, you're right. And it's, I, I, it's I don't want to be Alex Jones there. <laughs> yeah, <it's always> gonna, <laughs> but it is. It's going to be negative. It's always. It's never going to be positive. They're never going to look in through your shit and say, "Oh, you know what? This is. Let's do some positive shit for this guy." It's always going to be some fucked up bullshit that's coming your way. Um. 
So as far as corporations like Google and Facebook harvesting all this stuff, if, if they're just going to use it for advertising and to sell shit to me and, and they're going to make money off that, I have no problem with that. But the fact that, that uh, you know, Joe Blow from the government can knock on their door and say, hey, I need everything you got on this, this bloke, this guy. And they're like, uh, okay. I got a problem with that. Yeah. Anyway, I need to piss and it's getting on. So let's have a break. Let's do it. You can now hear all of the Mindset Central podcasts while on the go with the Stitcher Smart Radio app. On-demand news, talk, and more on your mobile phone. The latest episodes at Mindset Central are always available for you. No sinking needed and no memory or storage wasted. Available on your iPhone, iPad, Android phones, and beyond. Downloading is easy. Go to Stitcher.com or check out your app store. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to MindsetCentral.com. You're listening to the Mindset Network. Hi, everyone. This is Gareth from uh, MindsetCentral.com. Uh, just coming on really quickly to talk to you about subscribing or donating to Mindset Central. Um, right now, we average about 17 brand new podcasts a month on Mindset Central, and that's for free. So you get that content for free. It always has been free. And it will continue to be free. But uh, just take a moment to imagine the time and the effort it takes to put all that together. Plus also creating, building, sustaining the website and the server costs. Um, we're constantly finding ourselves reaching the point that, uh, that sometimes is the breaking point. And uh, we're, we're up against that old foe of time and money. And we're hoping that with your help, we can break through this wall. Not only do we want to continue with Mindset Central, but we want to build upon it and create something very special on the Internet. So please think about helping us and becoming a subscriber. By becoming a subscriber to Mindset Central, you'll have access to the subscriber section, which provides exclusive, all-new podcasts and a lot more. The subscriber section has and will continue to grow into an area that you will want to be a part of. And with monthly access priced at that of a, a large coffee at Starbucks. So for one coffee, you get access to the subscriber section. Packed with content, content that is continually added to on a weekly basis. So please help us. Help us by becoming a subscriber. Thank you. And we're back. All right, Joe. So main feature for this week's episode of the Mind Tech Podcast, we're going to talk about lightweight Linux. Now, lightweight Linux is exactly how it sounds lightweight and it's linux it's a very small um linux distribution that runs really well on pretty much any hardware you throw at it especially old hardware right joe yeah well my i did a roundup recently of lightweight desktop linux because there's there's various uh, linux distros that are for servers that are extremely lightweight but what i'm talking about is desktop linux with uh, being able to go on the internet and all the rest of it a desktop operating system and yeah there's there's various levels of um of lightweightness going from it's flashy um spinning cubes fancy 3d graphics uh desktop linux down to the the most minimal looking like some sort of amiga or something from yeah. 1993 um but yeah, it's, the the idea is that um, it, what we'll be talking about is is Linux that can run on older computers, um, 
or sometimes really ancient computers or even modern computers, but just if you want it to run just snappy and perfectly fast and no lag ever and you're never, never waiting for anything to... To, to load or anything like that. It's just quick, 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 everything. Oh, if, if you have um, a modern computer like an i5 or an i7 processor and you put one of these little light distributions on it, it's uh, it's ridiculously fast. Yeah, it's just, it it's, boots within a couple of seconds. It's beyond. It's, it's, like, um, it's like having an SSD but using a regular hard drive. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll I'll get down to it later because we'll we'll start at the from the heaviest okay. going down to the lightest. But um, just a, a bit of a spoiler that um, Tiny Core, for example, which is the the, the lightest uh, in in my i five uh, laptop w- with an SSD, um, it it boots boots within I don't know three or four seconds, and it's just super super fast. So, so but, from turning the power on on your laptop to having a full desktop ready to go is like three seconds. Uh, well, no, because I have to actually boot from USB thinking about it. Um, so it's turn the laptop on, tap escape, get the boot menu, go down to USB, press enter, enter again. And well, that's, you, you can't install it natively on, on, a, on the hard drive? Yes. Uh, no, you can do, but I've, just for my tests, I, oh, didn't, I see. didn't bother. I got you. But if if, if well, you did install it natively, it would be crazy fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like ridiculous. Especially with an SSD, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, so um, m- most people who are new to Linux will know uh, probably about Ubuntu or Linux Mint, right. maybe. Yeah. Um, and the the underlying technology... The, the actual operating system between Ubuntu and Linux Mint is almost the same. And they, they're both based... Well, Linux Mint is based on Ubuntu, and Ubuntu is based on Debian. Yeah. So the the, the core of the operating system is almost the same. Uh, it obviously varies from version to version with, with newer parts and all the rest of it, but essentially they're the same operating system. And it's just the UI that's different. In Ubuntu, it's called Unity. Yeah. Um, in Linux Mint, it's either Cinnamon or uh, Mate, Mate, whatever you want to say. And that's just the, the graphical front end to it. Now, the, 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 the easiest way to get a lightweight Linux is to take something like Ubuntu or Linux Mint and install a different desktop environment on top of it. Um, now, I go on about Zubuntu and XFCE, which is the first step down from the likes of Cinnamon and Unity. Because Cinnamon and Unity will work perfectly well on a, on a brand new i5 or whatever. Sure, sure, yeah. But if you've got, say, that ThinkPad, for example. Yeah. I mean, did you find Ubuntu was a little bit laggy? Not, not yeah. horrendously unusable, but just the odd little bit. No, I, I did. I mean, it, it, w- it, it was very usable, but things weren't popping. Yeah, it, it wasn't that perfectly snappy. I right. mean, obviously, compared to Windows, it's, it is night and day, as you but like But then again, on, on Windows, when I was uh, at the Windows 7 thing on it, it was the same deal. It, it, oh, no, fact, that's what I mean. Yeah, Windows, even on brand new hardware with a brand it's, new it's, right. install, it's just fucking atrocious. Right. Um, but um, so you, you tried uh, Zubuntu, and you noticed instantly that that was much snappier. Exactly, yes. Yeah, because it, that um, Zubuntu uses XFCE, which right. is the first sort of step down from those. Um, I, that, I also that, tried the Crunchbang too, and that was yeah, yeah, crazy well, we'll, fast. We'll get to that. Okay, that's, sorry, that's sorry. Open box. We'll get to <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, XFCE anyway um, is uh, it's very customizable, um, and it's I have it customized to look pretty much like Windows XP with the start menu and uh, quick launch. Uh, and, and my clock in the corner and a taskbar at the bottom and all that. Um, but you can also install docs and whatever you want. You can make it whatever you want if, yeah. if you are willing to customize it. And obviously the more uh, fancy stuff you install and, and customize, the, the little bit slower it's going to be. But if you go for a more or less default uh, Zubuntu, for example, then um, it's, you, you'll find that it's much quicker well, not much quicker, but that bit quicker than Ubuntu. Um, 
So that's XFC anyway. Um, and if you uh, follow the link in the show notes, you'll, you'll see this big blog post that I've done, and it's yeah. got instructions of how to install that. So you can you in. can um, you can install if you, if you're running uh, Debian or uh, a Ubuntu uh, derivative, you can just use the sudo apt-get and install these different desktops and yeah, pick and the then, one you yeah, like. It's, it, it, with all of the desktops that and in this section that I'm talking about, all you have to do is open a terminal, type some stuff sudo up get install and then the name of it then once it's finished installing just log out rather than switch off and then you, you get a session menu and that session menu allows you to just pick um and so it'd be by default it'd be unity right uh in ubuntu or cinnamon in linux mint um but then you can just go down to, to click xfce or zubuntu which because uh, zubuntu is a slightly modified version of xfc it's customized with different yeah. colors and different slightly now, different layout i, I did try that when i had um uh 1304 ubuntu installed i did go yeah. ahead and download the uh the cinnamon desktop for it yeah and logged out and logged back in with with cinnamon and uh it was like it was a kind of mismatch mishmash between uh mint and ubuntu yeah i uh, mean you'd have to do some customization of the colors and stuff to make it look yeah to look how you want um but anyway so that's that's the uh, xfce and zubuntu anyway um but the next step down is called lxde uh lightweight x11 desktop environment um now lxde is pretty much the same as xfce only a little bit faster pretty much um it's as customizable by default it comes looking like windows xp yeah uh, so it comes a little bit more like Windows XP than XFCE by default. Um, and uh, it's it's really great, really. It looks a little bit more old school than uh, XFCE by default, but you can change it. You can change the theme and the colors, and you can really customize it. Um, now, uh, LXDE is brilliant. And if it wasn't for the fact that I am so boring and just like to pick something and stick with it, then I would probably be using it on my main machine. I, I was just, just going to ask you, how come you're not using this? Well, because I hadn't heard of it when I settled on XFCE, because uh, I settled on XFCE very early on, yeah. and I've just stuck with it, and I know how it works. I know right. how to customize it exactly how I want. And um, I've got a really old netbook that I've talked about before, an uh, EPC 701, one of the original Asus netbooks. And um, I've got it. I've got LXTE on that, and it runs pretty well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, if I had heard of LXTE, I would have been using it. Right. Although to be fair, when I switched to XFCE, LXTE, I don't even know if it was around. And if it was, it wouldn't have been as developed as, as it is now. Okay. And it did have some bugs in it until recently, but it's yeah. I would really recommend checking that out if you if you don't mind that kind of Windows paradigm. Of the, with the start menu and, and the taskbar and everything. Okay. Um, so then you've got two that are very similar, which are Fluxbox and Openbox. Um, and, and again, this is a step step down in, in weight and a step up in speed. Fluxbox um, is, I don't know, I don't really like it. It's, um, it's similar to Openbox, but it's just harder to use. Like, to... to to configure it, you need to edit text files. Yeah. And there's no GUI tools to do that. Um, and it, it is, uh, it, it does have a taskbar. That, that, that's the difference. But by default, Flux, Fluxbox has uh, a taskbar at the bottom. But in order to, to do anything that you want, like um, access the programs or whatever, you have to right click on the desktop. Um, uh, Openbox is more like uh, Crunchbang, huh? Well, no, Crunchbang is Debian with Openbox. Ah, oh, okay. Basically. Um, and so, yeah, Openbox is what I would recommend over, over Fluxbox, which I just don't really see as relevant. Because Openbox exists, there's no point to have Fluxbox. Now, Fluxbox is really customizable. By default, in Ubuntu, it comes with just a gray... You, you boot it, you, you, know, you install it, you log out, log back in with that selected, and it's just a gray screen. And, and, a, uh, and a mouse cursor, and you're thinking, what the, has it worked? And then you right-click, <laughs> and you get a menu. You get the menu, right. And it's it just super minimal. But 
the, that is Openbox really is a base um, from which to build your own right. desktop environment, pretty much, um, which is what LXDE is. LXDE uses Openbox as the base, and then just with some other stuff installed on top of it, right. like a, a dock, uh, well, a taskbar, um, a start menu, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, the clock and everything is just using Openbox as the base. So the thing is, it can go from the most minimal, just blank screen to LXD, a very functional um, uh, desktop experience. So that that is why Openbox is really good because it's so flexible and so customizable, and so you can really just make it your own. And uh, Crunchbang have uh, have made it their own, um, but they've kept it very very minimal. Yeah, it's they? very basic. I mean, I've not used it for a long time, but my understanding was it just basically a black screen with um, with, uh, with the, the system monitor information on one side. Yeah, it is. It's, it's very, very minimum, minimal, um, uh, but it doesn't look old-fashioned. Mm, yeah, whereas a default open box looks a little bit old it school. It does, yeah. It looks, it looks ancient. But uh, Crunchbang, it's, it's the same kind of concept as uh, op- open box. Uh, but it looks a little, it looks a little more, more modern. Uh, but and it is very, very quick, very fast. Yeah. Well, all they've done is they've just customized Openbox to to their taste, right? And, right. Um, and yeah, made it good. Yeah. Uh, basically. Um, so yeah, that that's Openbox. I mean, as I say, with Fluxbox and Openbox, uh, Openbox wins basically. Um, there's such a thing as a tiling window manager now i've never really used them because they just it, the idea doesn't make sense to me now from what i understand it and from the screenshots that i've seen you open one program up it fills the whole screen you right. open up a second program and it then it splits the screen in two and they both given half the the space oh, you open sorry. up a third one and it, it then and, and a fourth and it just quarters and it just keeps keeps going yeah and i just I just don't dig that, really. It just doesn't make any sense to me why you'd want to do that. Well, it would be cool if, if you're in, like, a server environment and you have specific uh, applications that you need running all the time. Mm. You could just open up three or four of them. They'd all fill the screen, and you could just, with a glance, see what, what's going on immediately without, you know, going through menus and clicking on stuff. Yeah, but anyone who's doing serious server stuff... Or anyone who knows what they're doing with servers would be running it headless with just SSH, wouldn't they? Right. With no, no, there wouldn't even be a screen on it. So, yeah, yeah I don't know about. I just they don't seem relevant to me. But they, some of them, from my understanding, some of these tiling window managers are seriously lightweight. So that's why I've mentioned them. Right. So if if that idea appeals to you, then fair enough. And there's a link to a list of them on Wikipedia. So. Uh, yeah, yeah so that uh, there are many, many other desktop environments and window managers, um, but uh, they, they're the main ones that I have tried and, and know stuff about. So um, there, there are some that are very lightweight. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it for that for now anyway. Um, then you've got some lightweight distributions. Now, um, if you want... Uh, you, you can obviously install these des- these lightweight desktops on top of something like Ubuntu or Linux Mint, but you can get um, uh, dis- distributions that are just that, that have these lightweight desktops uh, uh, ready by to go. Default. Because if if you ha- if you just download the, the default Ubuntu and uh, you're like, yeah, I'm not into Unity, I want to put the uh, XFCE on it or whatever. Yeah, you can download that, install it, log out, then log back into the right window environment. Yeah. But Unity hasn't gone away; it's still there. It's still taking up hard drive space. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. If hard drive space is, uh, I mean, I'm I'm assuming that you've got plenty of hard drive space, but really, the desktop environments don't take up that much space, really, relative to the operating right. But system. It, but if you go with a specific, like if if uh, XFC is your deal. Then yeah. it's probably best just to go with Ubuntu rather than going with regular Ubuntu and then installing it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the same with LXDE. There's um, Lubuntu or there's Peppermint, which is based on Lubuntu, but kind of with some Mint stuff in there, Linux Mint stuff. Right. Um, and then Openbox, uh, Crunchbang is your best bet for that. I would say definitely. Right. Um, 
which was originally based on Ubuntu, but has moved to Debian, um, which see, is obviously... What, what do you think the, uh, the rationale behind that is? Why would they do that, do you think? <clears throat> well, I think it's because they are thinking the same thing as me, that Ubuntu cannot continue the way... Unless something changes, it cannot continue the way it is now because it may canonical who makes Ubuntu are losing money yeah. and well the hemorrhaging hemorrhaging money and have been since they started. And they've also made some very controversial decisions and it's not very community based anymore. Um and it's uh, the, the official line is that well Ubuntu's based on Debian, so why not just cut out the middleman? Just make it <laughs> Right, right. Because I, I mean, um, I, this is all speculation. We, we we don't know why they did it. I mean, if we asked them, I guess they'd probably tell us. But uh, uh, if from your thought process, it is that um, Ubuntu is probably going to go away within the next five years. That's my prediction. Yeah. Um, well, uh, within the next by the end of the decade, I would say. Yeah. The Ubuntu. Won't be won't exist as it does now. There, there'll be some fork of it and or whatever. Simply because they're 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 not making any money. Mm. They 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 have no. Um, I mean, they have a business. They have a website. They're creating, doing all this research and creating this this uh, this operating system, but they're giving it away for free. Yeah. Well, the, to be fair, Debian is the same. Debian is completely free, but the, Debian is a real community effort and it relies on donations uh, etc and it's because it's got a really core like a really hardcore base of developers who develop for free um and and people who host it host the the mirrors for free like bite mark hosting in the uk for example um uh it's uh, um debian is just the ultimate model of community linux basically yeah free as in freedom and beer and uh, i can never ever uh there can never be too much love for debian because it's just so awesome as far as i'm concerned so are you planning um, to switch anytime soon away from well, no, uh, the, I mean, the thing is deal? That I, I do say that but um what canonical have done with debian is they've taken something really awesome and polished it up a little bit and made it just work a little bit better so for me I have used Debian before, uh, but I, I just think that Ubuntu suits my needs better. I'm not saying it's better, but it just... Debian is a brilliant base, but um, some of the tinkering that Ubuntu and Ubuntu have done to it have made it work better for me. Right. So that's why. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's... Uh, they're, they, they're, they're all the, basically the usable day-to-day um, lightweight Linuxes. That be beyond this, you're getting into hobbyist territory, basically, so, where you're not... So basically everything that we've discussed so far, um, if you have a fairly modern PC, will run like a dream. It'll yeah. run flawlessly and ridiculously fast. Yeah, ex- exactly. If, you, if you're if you used to Windows, like say you've got a computer that's two years old. Right. And it's got Windows 7 on it, and you haven't reformatted it in uh, yeah. in those two years. And it, you start to go, oh, God, this is so fucking shit. <laughs> and then you boot just off a USB stick or a CD into Lubuntu, say, LXTE. You'll be like, fuck me, this is amazingly fast. Yeah, It looks a bit old school and a little bit kind of... Crazy, crazy well, fast, it, though. Oh, amazingly fast. I mean, I always go back to Amiga-ish because that's kind of yeah. my first right, right. computer. Like that, that really sort of nineties look. The, it's kind, that of, kind got of vibe, that, yeah. Yeah, it's got a hint of that about it. Whereas yeah. Zubuntu, I think, looks more modern and nicer. Yeah. You uh, coming from the Mac, you probably disagree with that, but uh, well, it, it, it it's it, yeah, it's modern er. <laughs> It's modern, yeah. more modern than than uh, than the Amiga for sure. We're getting into the late nineties <laughs> rather than the early nineties. Yes. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's circa two thousand and three rather than nineteen ninety three. Yeah, I would okay. guess that's very harsh, but okay. Um, um, so yeah, basically, all, but all of the ones that we've mentioned so far, I I could use day to day if I if and I would to, recommend day to day. And depending on how fast you want it, it's, it, you know, you, you go, it's a spectrum, isn't it? Yeah. And a decision, a trade-off between 
uh, functionality and speed. So it depends on how old your computer is and now how what, what, fast you want it to run. Now, what if you have an older computer? Let's say you purchased uh, a brand new top of the line Dell PC in 1999. And it's just sitting there. You haven't booted it for 10 years. Uh, but you think, hey, I can put Linux on this. What, to be what, honest, what, I think CrunchBang would probably run all right on it. Yeah, I was going to say, what, what's, what kind of options do you have here for, for a machine that's probably like a Pentium 3 or a Pentium 4? You know, that's a little... That's... Oh, no, a Pentium 4 will run CrunchBang, no problem. But, for example, I've got um, uh, an IBM ThinkPad, curiously okay. enough, right. A20M, which is uh, it's either a Pentium 3 or a Celeron. I'm, I haven't booted into it recently but it's like properly old school it came with windows 98 okay so So um, definitely late 90s no no uh, mid 90s i would say oh okay Uh, earlier than that yeah uh, i would guess i mean it was pretty fat and top of the range when it was bought but um well uh, i'm not sure when windows 98 came out i mean obviously 98 around 98 it came out in 97 i think yeah Okay, so oh, did it come with 95? I don't know. Anyway, suffice to say, it's properly ancient. Right. Um, and um, for a while, I used Puppy Linux on it, which is the, the first of the, the distros that are um, not based on Ubuntu or Debian that I'm going to talk about. Now, obviously, there are loads more bases like Slackware, yeah. um, the Fedora slash Red Hat base, um, uh, so open SUSE base, uh, stuff like that. But I, I have found that Debian is the best, so that's what I, I I'm talking about stuff that I know about. Okay. So that's that's why this whole thing is a little bit Debian and Ubuntu centric. So pu- Puppy fan, Linux is uh, is very very lightweight. Yeah, Puppy Linux. It's um, well, you you know from downloading the likes of Ubuntu and CrunchBang, that they're around about a CD to a DVD, so around about 700 megabytes to a gigabyte right. download. Yeah. Or sometimes a little bit more for, for Linux Mint. I think it might be 1.2 or something. Right. But it, uh, for argument's sake, around about a gigabyte. Well, the download for Puppy is, I think, 120-something megabytes. Wow. Uh, oh, if you think that's wow, wait till we get further on. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's and the idea of Puppy, the founding principle of it is that it runs from RAM. So when you boot it, it copies the entire operating system into RAM. Oh, so it's flying then. So it absolutely flies. Even on uh, that ancient um, ThinkPad, it runs reasonably well. And I was a um, now the thing is, I haven't used Puppy for about four or five years. Okay. Um, since I got money to buy proper computers, basically. Um, And, but when I used it, but four or five years ago, I I managed to turn this shitty ancient ThinkPad into a usable machine. I mean, obviously it wasn't amazing, but I was able to go online. I mean, back then it was, I was um, browsing 4chan G quite a lot, the technology board on 4chan. And I was, I had no problems there. I could do screenshots and, um, you know, and participate in threads and all the rest of it. Um, and even watch some videos, I think. Um, and, and that was using Puppy. But the, uh, I devote quite a big section to Puppy in this blog post. Um, and the bottom line is that it used to be you'd go to Puppy website, download it, and that would be it. Now, there's two websites, because there's some sort of shit going on in the community that I, I'm too lazy to investigate. But there's populinux.org and populinux.com. Yeah, and one is the it. official site and one is the community site. Ah. And they've both got different version numbers for download. Um, and there's various versions. They've made it compatible with Ubuntu packages and um, uh, um, Slackware so there's, there's various versions of it, and it's just a fragmented mess. And the website is just horribly confusing. When you first look at you've got these two websites. Which one? One is linked from Wikipedia. One, if you Google Puppy Linux. So I, I don't know what's going on with it. But um, I tried two versions of it anyway um, a couple of days ago. 
um, uh, both both the Ubuntu compatible versions because I thought, well, that's I know more about that Debian and Ubuntu, um, and one of them was just just didn't work properly. I was trying to refresh the package list, trying to install VLC Media Player, and it just wouldn't work. So I tried the other one, and I managed to get it to work, and it, it worked pretty well uh, when I I did it. But um, you do you know about uh, apt get update? Does that mean anything to you? Let's update the OS, right? Uh, no, no. What apt get update does? It refreshes the package list. So um, when you uh, when they make the ISO of the uh, uh, of the, the distro, so it's say Ubuntu, uh, they stick it up uh, and then you download that, and that's a snapshot of it at, at a certain point in time. Right. But then all the packages that you, you know, say VLC, it's version two point one point one point three. Um, but then in the couple of weeks um, since they put the ISO up, there's, there's version 2.1.1.4. Um, and so when, when you try and um, download the, the packages to install VLC, there's, there's a mismatch between what your computer thinks is available and what is available. So you need to update the, the package list, basically. So it downloads a list of all the available packages from the server. And so it goes, okay, well, so it's version this. So you're, version that. you're on the same page, basically, between the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So you need to basically sync with the, uh, right. the, the servers. Um, now, to do that in Ubuntu, you is sudo apt-get update. And um, on, a, on a decent machine, it's, it'll take, I don't know, a minute maybe, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, in Puppy, I had to go open the package manager, go to another screen, and then I found the button, clicked it, and I'm not shitting you. It took 15 minutes to update the package list. So it was that out, it was that out of date, or just no slow connection? No, no. Well, neither. It the it downloaded them reasonably quickly, um, but then it processed what it had downloaded. Now Ubuntu does the same thing, and Debian does the same thing. It downloads it, and then it kind of um, processes the, the information that's downloaded into a package list. But for some reason, this processed every individual package individually, and you just saw a big a scrolling list of all the packages, <coughs> and there's shit loads of them, and it took 15 minutes for the computer to process it. Um, so that I was really not impressed by that. Right. Um, but then I got VLC installed. And you got it working it. eventually, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and I managed to stream a video, and it had sound, and uh, it worked. It was, yeah, it was, it worked pretty well. Um, but so you could say, well, Puppy is a, a usable distro once you get, you know, when, once you fuck about with it and make it uh, install everything that you want. Yeah. Um, however, and it's, this is a big however. <laughs> um, you know, when you install Ubuntu, it asks you for a username. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so you put in Joel or Gareth, whatever, yep. and a password for that user. And then, um, but then to install anything, it, you need to sudo it, which it basically is giving you root, super root user access, privileges. Right? Yeah, yeah, root privileges. Um, and it, it notifies you when it needs root privileges, and you have to identify with the password. Exactly, yeah. Now, now Debian is a little bit different. It has a separate root password than user password. But anyway, suffice to say, they have users. Like, that's the, f- the founding principle of Unix, isn't it? That you have a root user and then other users with various permissions. Well, and, that, um, that goes back to the old mainframe days, right? Where you'd have, yeah, yeah, you'd Unix, have yeah. one, one computer running Unix and, there, and then dumb terminals where multiple could, people could log into the same machine at the same time in their own session. Yeah, and but that, they could only they could only uh, do certain things because they had restricted privileges. Right, but but that that uh, that whole thing is is it hasn't gone away. It's still very much a part of of Unix and Linux. Yeah, yeah, um, and and you don't want to have root privileges to do many things apart from change right. your system because it's, uh, it's a hacker's dream. Plus, you could also fuck shit up by mistake. Exactly. So, um, for example, if you run in the file manager, Thuna or an XFCE or uh, Nautilus or whatever, um, you, and you try and you, you browse, if you want to make a new folder in your home directory, so in my case, home slash Joe, um, make a new folder, copy some stuff to it, no problem. Whereas if I go to um, etc., etc., yeah. and try and make a new folder, it problems. won't let me. Right. 
because you need root privileges to exactly. do that. Now, you can do it by uh, opening the file manager as root and, and then doing it, but you don't really want to be doing that. And you definitely do not want to run a web browser or an email client as root because it, it's, it's just a hacker's dream, as you say. It, you give if, access to everything. Yeah, it just really compromises you. Now, the thing with Puppy is this project has been going 10 years now, right? And still, there are no users, and when you boot it, you boot into the root account. Really? So every, everything you're doing is as root. So that is just a terrible decision. Wow. I don't know why they have not sorted that out. I can understand when you first make a project, uh, it's easier to do it, everything as root, and yeah, if you, it's just a hobbyist thing. But come on, guys, you've had 10 years and you still haven't sorted that shit out. Right, yeah, that's... that's uh... So that is a huge no-no. So that's why I would say never and use you think it day-to-day. With, with the name Puppy Linux, it's kind of appealing to, like, newbies, right? To people who are uh, maybe installing it for the first time. Oh, Puppy Linux, that sounds like fun. Let's slap that on my computer. And you're going to install this and have, you know, the slightest thing. You could just fuck up your whole, your whole machine. Yeah, exactly. If you don't know what you're doing with it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I would really not recommend using it day-to-day. For so, that reason, if, so what, if they, what would you recommend if if you want to run um, a crazy small, ultra fast distribution on old hardware? What if pu- Puppy Linux is not where it's at? What what would you recommend? Well, one that another one I wouldn't recommend is damn small Linux. Now, as the name suggests, it's very small. Now, I said Puppy is about a hundred. <laughs> it's damn something. small. Yeah. Um, it, Puppy's about 120 something megabyte. Now, damn small Linux is about 50 megabytes. Wow. Um, and uh, it, it, the, it was, this project was chugging, uh, chugging along until about 2008 when it seemingly died. And then last year, it seems to have been resurrected with a new release candidate. But I, I didn't check out the release candidate. I checked out the last stable release, which is 4.4. And I remember checking that out back in the day, thinking, oh, my God, this is amazing. It's only 50 megabytes, and it's like a proper desktop, and I can like, actually browse the web and, and, and look at my files and all that, and it's only 50. This is amazing. But um, I, it, it just didn't work. I couldn't get a network connection. I tried wireless, I tried Ethernet, and just shit was not working. So I just couldn't really do anything with it. Um, uh, I couldn't even take a screenshot with it, um, which leads me on to... Tiny Core, Tiny Core Linux. Now, um, you think damn small Linux is small. Yeah. Well, Tiny Core has got three uh, versions. One of them is uh, basically headless. It's just a, a, a terminal, and that's that's eight megabytes. But the, the, that's not a huge surprise. You can get server distros that are very small like that. Um, it's got one full featured one that's sixty four megabytes, so a little bit bigger than <laughs> damn small, which has got various programs. But there's one that is just a desktop and nothing else. It's got the ability to install programs on top of it, and that is 12 megabytes. Oh my so I could God. email you the, I could email you the, uh, the ISO for that. Wow, that is that's yeah. crazy. That's like it is crazy. And I'm looking at some of the screenshots here, and it's actually quite a nice desktop. Very minimal, very minimal. Yeah, it actually comes with a, a very OS X style, yeah, OS X like style the, dock. Yeah, the dock at the bottom, uh, very minimal. Yeah, and it's an animated dock as well. The, it does that same, like, uh, as you scroll along it, things grow and shrink and yeah. stuff. And it's, uh, it's, yeah, so if you've got an ancient, ancient computer, then um, Tiny Core is what I would recommend. Now, let me ask you this, though. So you you got an older computer. You install Tiny Core. You get it up and running. You see the desktop, everything's working. It works at a pretty good speed. Can you put modern applications on here and do modern stuff with it? Or are you kind of stuck in the year 2000? Well, I played with it briefly, and I installed Firefox and VLC Media Player, two very modern So the, the latest versions of Firefox and stuff? Uh, it wasn't the latest version of Firefox, but I'm sure that I could... You can just download one and, and run it. Um, uh, it, is, it is capable of running Firefox, the latest version I would hazard a guess at. And how, and, how did it run? Did it run good? Uh, well, the problem is that I didn't spend enough time with it, and um, it, the, my aspect ratio wasn't right, 
and um, it had no sound. Um, those things, I'm sure, can be fixed by installing applications. Yeah. I mean, it's so bare bones that it just doesn't even have a sound uh, mixer or whatever to to interface with it. But I'm sure that it is possible to, to do it, that to get it if working. you spend enough time. But you got you got to fool with it to get uh, get the right drivers and get it working. But it is doable. Yeah. Now, I I didn't try the 64 megabyte version. Maybe I should have done because I I get the feeling that that 64 meg version might have sound and stuff working right um and this 12 megabyte version only has us layout keyboard and stuff pretty basic um, it's it's very basic but if it, to me it's it wins the prize i mean unless someone can prove me wrong but it wins the prize for size of download versus usability there's nothing as small as that as usable as that wow i don't think and it, it's it's basically rendered damn small linux irrelevant all right, so, so let's let's kind of wrap this up here then. So if you have a fairly modern machine, what's your recommendation? If you've got a machine from the last couple of years, Zubuntu, XFCE, uh, with with Ubuntu, Zubuntu is definitely the way to go. And if you have an older machine that's pushing 8 to 10 years old? Uh, well, maybe not that old. I mean, if, if you've got one that's kind of 5, 6 years old, I'd say Lubuntu. Yeah. LXDE. If it's a little bit older than that, Crunchbang. And if you've got something that's just ancient, really, really ancient, then um, Tiny, Tiny Core. Core, I'd say. All right. Cool deal. That's a great overview, uh, Joe. And uh, we'll have links to your article, which uh, is very, very detailed with screenshots and links and how to install all this stuff. Uh, very, very detailed and uh, well put together article on um, a good overview of uh, lightweight Linux desktops. Well, we've we've come to the end here of a, another uh, episode of the Mind Tech podcast. Before we go, do we have any feedback at all, Joe? Uh, no, I mean there was some some chatter in the Facebook group as usual, um, but no no real huge bits of feedback. So if if there's something that we've said that you agree with or disagree with or Let want us, us to talk about. Yeah, shoot us an email at uh, mindsetcentral at gmail dot com, or jump onto the Mindset Facebook uh, group and uh, post some comments. We always love to hear from you guys. Yeah, but, and maybe you could comment on my conspiracy theory that I came up with today. <laughs> it's a good which one, which I was talking to, talk to Gareth about during the break, and and that is very straightforward. If the new world order exists, and they really are going for this one world army, one world government, and one world currency. Uh, could that be linked to the fact that nobody knows who invented Bitcoin? Oh. And could it be that Bitcoin has been sold to, to the, the world as this, um, this big fuck you to the banks <laughs> and, and like this international one world currency that's uh, going to help everyone out and be all freedom and everything? Could it be, could it be that it is the Illuminati who's invented it to, to, uh, to fuck with us? Could it be indeed? Well, we look forward to your comments on that. If you have any comments and or ideas on uh, Joe's new conspiracy theory or anything that we've discussed this week on the Mind Tech Podcast, please let us know. Shoot us an email, post in the Facebook group, even post on MindsetCentral.com. Comments are open, so you can add uh, any comments you have directly to the podcast in question. Well, until next week, we'll be back with more topics, more conversation, and more news. We'll see you then. Farewell, good brothers. See you later.